Justin, what's up, man? It's good to finally connect and make this happen. Man, I know. I'm so excited to uh, get to be on the show. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, I know you got a lot of great supporters out there, so I'm excited to share my story with them. Yeah, no, I, I am too. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful to Sean as well, because I know you and I oh, have man. been kind of connected. And then Sean's like, hey, I just met with Justin. I'm like, I've been talking with Justin. It's crazy how small of a world it is when you run in these like high caliber circles. Absolutely. Sean was the man. They just raised $50,000 for Fight for the Forgotten. I got to announce there with him, which he, his gift to me for coming out and speaking besides the $50,000 that they raised, which was incredible. The yeah. first gift was, was your book, Sovereignty. And oh, so, sweet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. he, he signed it for me, wrote me a very kind letter. And uh, I'm just really grateful for that team. It's uh, revolution financial management and they're killing it. And they made people's lives better, man. I, I was inspired by them. I didn't know exactly what I was going into their energy, but to see a team that's all about like meeting the needs of the underserved, like that was right up my wheelhouse. And they're like, look, we're not just going after being financial advisors for like the ultra wealthy. We're going to make right. sure anybody can, can create wealth and build that. And I was like, what a, what a powerful mission. Yeah. I mean, I don't know too much about his business. I know a little bit about it because I actually used to work for an organization that is, is tied in with what they're doing. Um, but yeah, I've been hunting with Sean. He's been out here to my place. Like he's, he's top notch, man. He really is. Absolutely. Cool. I got to tell you, uh, first and foremost, man, you're looking good. Like you've been on this, like, I don't, have you been on the fitness kick lately? Like, I don't want to say kick. I think that I, I don't think that doesn't service, but like right. you, you've been looking good, man. You're working hard. It, it looks good. It shows. Thank you. It's, it's been more about consistency and dialing everything in. So that's been good. And I, this move to Austin has, has really helped me a lot. I moved here from Oklahoma city. I'm a Dallas Fort Worth kid, but I lived in Colorado and I've been very grateful and fortunate to be able to train with some of the best in the world um, from wrestling. I've had, I don't know, four or five Olympic gold medalists that have coached me. Um, but my first two coaches, Kenny Monday, Kim Cross, both Olympic gold medalists. They were the only high school coaches that were Olympic gold medalists. And we had oh, two really? at the same school. Yeah. Two at Dang. the same school. One was my training partner. So I had no excuse, but to get, get good, but they, they taught me a lot. And one of those things was, you know, just do the basics and do, get the fundamentals down and really build on that. Like I, I came into wrestling late in the game. I was 15 years old when I stepped on the mats, but I was national champ by 17. But the first year year of wrestling, I lost every match uh, except one by one point. Of course. They, they said, stop trying to learn 10, 20, 30 moves. These guys have, you know, they've been wrestling since they were kids. Just get two moves that nobody can stop no matter what, even if they know it's coming. And so uh, that's been cool to get back to the basics and say, you know, I want to be open-minded um, in my MMA training always. But like, do what works and keep doing that. And moving down here to Austin, physical fitness hasn't ever really been my thing. It's been, I want to get on the mats. I want to wrestle to get the strength for wrestling. I want to box to get the technique and and timing down. I want to do jujitsu to get great at that. And then coming down here, I've been training a lot at uh, on it gym ATX, and man, that's that's been killer to be surrounded by guys that move with a purpose or very intentional. Uh, and I think a lot of times MMA fighters and their coaches probably try to beat them down because you're getting ready for a fight. So what it may, I mean, it kind of makes sense to like beat your body down so that you'll be stronger and better for the fight. But really strength, strength training for a fighter, you should be building your body back up because every other thing in training is beating your body down. So you got to make sure you get there to the fight and that you recover well. And so that intentional movement, it's, it's always there with wrestling, jiu-jitsu, but taking that into another side of it with like coaches that understand, like that's been really helpful for my growth. Well, and, and, and most of us who are listening, like if, me, for example, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I won't speak for anybody else. Like I'm not going to go fight at elite levels, but I do want to make sure I'm taking care of my body. I want my nutrition right. to be locked in. I want to feel good when I wake up. I want to have sex with my wife. I want to be able to wrestle with my kids. Like, I don't need to beat the hell out of myself. I just want to be strong and fit. Right. No, that's, that's totally part of it. And I think maybe uh, fighters live in the extremes. A lot of times it's a little bit of a roller coaster. 
It's got to be your personality though, too, right? Like I don't, I I imagine you couldn't be incredible because I know you've competed at the top echelons of competition in MMA and, and and combat sports. Like you can't be that unless you're willing to go all in. That's a different personality trait. Yeah. I think all in for sure. And I think there's a lot of great things that, that come from that. I just had, uh, training partner on my podcast and uh he's also my coach but his name's rafael Lobato jr the most That's accomplished that. american to ever do the sport of jiu-jitsu i think he's got like 12 world medals five or six world championships and he's the undefeated mma world champion retired that way and he's an incredible dude but he talks about you know hey just live your passion if you're living your passion you can go all in and he goes it's hard for you know you to really know everything you've got if you don't go all in. And so I've kind of been that, whether it's through fighting, whether it's through fight for the free Men on profit, it's like, I just, I have to jump all in into the deep end to really get the knowledge. It's one thing to read about it. It's another thing to like watch it. But, um, you know, whenever you get your hands on it, whether it's in fighting, like I'm like, okay, show me, uh, tell me, show me, but now let me do it too and watch and, and dissect it while I do it. Um, yeah. so that I really have a hands-on approach and start to get understanding. Cause I'm not just hearing it or seeing it. Like my hands are on it and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it at the same time. And so same thing with going over to Africa was, uh, living with the pygmy people. The goal was like, listen to them, learn from them, uh, like live with them. And then you'll know the most appropriate way to love them, right? Live with, listen to, learn from, love them. And it's because- that, uh, Stephen Covey's principle I, th- I think it's Stephen Covey who says seek first to understand then you'll be understood I- I'm paraphrasing Ooh. that and I probably butchered it but sure. that's what it sounds yeah. like yeah that sounds great I-, I I knew coming from this culture this country um me being a big blonde burly guy going to yeah. live in another culture where I stand out like a sore thumb it's going to be a learning process and I better be willing to not say hey I have the solution when I didn't ever understand the problem, like I, uh, the, like it hit me like a Mac truck or uh, like a cheap shot. The blind, blind, got blindsided by the water crisis when uh, uh, I was actually holding a little boy and he passed away. Um, and oh, in your even, arms? Yeah, well, I was cupping the back of his yeah. hand, head and holding his little hand when blood came out of his ears, and and uh, and that forever changed my life. Uh, I would have never understood in the same capacity as just reading a story about it. You know, hearing, hearing 3.4 million people die of the water crisis every year, like that's an overwhelming statistic and 2 million are children under the age of five years old. You know, that's an overwhelming statistic and, but you read it and it can, it can hit you, but sometimes just reading something can, or, or hearing it goes in one ear and out the hearing other, it. but I mean, even on this it, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. See, seeing it um, and, you know, knowing that the pills that would have cured them were $1, the one shot cure was $3, the casket mm-hmm. we buried them in was $30, like I, I helped dig the grave and I, I, I took a, 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 a wild turn there going into this story, but it's like, and going back to what Sean and them are helping fund and that I got to announce there uh, a few weeks ago is that we're building a health center now that's in honor of this young man named Andy Bo, um, so that they're not denied hospital treatment ever again. He was, his mom was told, you're too dirty to come in here into the health center. Oh, um, his mom, the second time when they had the money, which they had to beg for the money when they, when they had it, said, we won't waste our medicine on a pygmy animal. Like this stuff was overwhelming to hear and to see and to live or experience or at least be in, the, in that environment um, and culture and be invited in. So then it's like, oh, wow, now I'll never, ever forget that. And I, um, I think, you know, let go of the purpose or the passion or the drive for it because like I've seen it, it's my lived experience now. Um, and like it, it really hits home. Like, and, and my, my home, like, I, I don't, this sounds cheesy, like a cheesy saying, but like home, home really is where the heart is. Like our body is our home. Like, so whether it's here in the States, there, in in Congo or Uganda, like I, I carry that with me. And it's something that now is why I'm coming back to fighting 
um, why I've started a podcast is like the purpose is to make it meaningful so that it can hopefully create change and transformation and in a sustainable way, empower people to fight for people um, and to overcome their greatest struggles. Remember that they've overcome 100% of their darkest days. Now they get to go out and, and whether it's share light or share love um, with every dark nook and cranny and dark place in the world because because it we all need it right now especially we all need it and i think also that there are some people who are in the position to share it but i think the overwhelming majority of people are not in the position to do that and so they need somebody else to help get them to a place where they can do it for themselves yeah that's that's the main mission of of fight for the forgotten the non our nonprofit is we equip people with the tools, educate them with the knowledge and empower them to be the change they want to see in their when own. When you community. say people, who, who are you referring to? Ugandans, oh, pygmies? Like who is it that yeah, you're referring the, to? The pygmy people that I, I, I lived with. They, I'm called the big pygmy on Instagram. I used to be the Viking. <laughs> the big white uh, pygmy. What, yeah, but what, well, t- tell me about the pygmy people. Is, is that a tribe? Is yeah, that, tribe. Like, what, what exactly group. is that? Got it. Well, it's a it's a people group that that consists of the Mabuti pygmies, the Batwa pygmies, the Twa, the uh, Fa Baka Aka Bayaka, but uh, their stature they stand on average four foot seven, um, really? and because of yeah, on for the men uh, is four foot seven. And why I'm actually really curious about that is that because they've just I, I'm trying to say there, it in the right way. There's a, there's a couple different theories, and okay. it's vitamin D deficiency. Uh, Got it. because of uh, that helps bone growth and uh, and other things, but they live under the canopy of the rainforest. They've always been the people of the forest and I absolutely so love they're not them getting sunlight. That. Is that what you're saying? Not a lot. plus they're they're not um, eating as much nutritious food um, and and uh, some anthropologists or or people that are pointing to evolution are saying like they needed to be small, nimble. Uh, to be light on their feet, quick in the forest, um, and things like that. So I think it's I think it's a, a few different things, but like I don't know, they're just the loved. There's the loved, a little bit smaller people, but they're they're brilliant, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're wonderful. They're, they're to me, they're actually closer to some of my than the most of my blood family. I love so are are they um are they are they an isolated tribe i imagine that has to do with it too because once you start you know for again for for like lack of saying it in the right way you know you're you're having babies with other pygmies you know there's obviously some genetic and hereditary uh, factors that come into play they're probably are they isolated like they're not uh they they haven't been welcomed into the neighboring tribes uh for centuries um, because they've been seen as different, as less than, as even subhuman. Um, wow. And something I could point back to is people will say, how, how could a doctor say we won't waste medicine on a pygmy animal talking about Andibo, um, mm. which is horrific. But I would say even us in the U S like a uh, hundred years ago, there's a story of a, a, a Mabuti pygmy man in pretty much the village that I lived in for a year. Um, and I built up two years going back and forth the last 10 years. And um, there's a, a man named Otabinga from 1904 to 1906. Uh, American explorers went and got him from uh, the Ituri rainforest where I lived and brought him back and put him in the St. Louis World Fair for like two years. And they're basically touring him as a freak show. And then in 1904 to 1906, this made the cover of the New York Times saying Otabinga, the pygmy in the zoo, breaks all these records, uh, attendance records for the Bronx Zoo. They had over 50,000 okay. people zoo. coming for the zoo. They put them in the monkey house and they were feeding them oh, bananas geez. and saying that it was half man, half animal. And so it's been a, it's been a thought of like a lot of the people of the world that these people aren't truly people. And, um, and I would say that they're surrounding tribes or neighbors, the people groups have been stuck in a mindset that, that uh, had heavy influence from colonialism and things like that a uh, hundred years ago, 200 years ago. Um, are the, are they content, the pygmy people content with being isolated or uh, they love the forest. They, so that's their home and bitterness and, and things of, there as well. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot of hurt, but they're the most forgiving people I've ever known in my life. 
uh, which is mm. beautiful. Um, and part of our organization is working towards reconciliation and a redemption story. And so I would say that when I first went there, I, you know, and when Andy Bo's slave master told me it was cheaper to bury them than to keep them alive. I had never in my life wanted to murder a person. Um, and I thought about it. You I said slave it. master. What like, yeah. Like, so is that like legitimately a slave, like explain yeah, that to me. A, a lot of people don't know that on earth today, there's more slaves than ever in human history. Uh, if you Google that fact, low statistics will tell you 28 million higher statistics will tell you an average of 40 million, uh, slaves on earth today, uh, Damn. literally more than ever. Um, and so there's a lot of, I mean, it's all over the world, but, um, but Africa, uh, India, uh, uh, some Asian nations, I think China, and there's, it's just, it, it, and it's varies in scales. I've seen, I've seen the almost blood diamond looking movie type stuff where there's, there's child mining with rebel groups around them. I've actually seen those places. I've seen a 12 year old pulled out of a mine dead because the cave collapsed on them. That was going for gold or coltan coltans in all of our smartphones. And some people think that the uh, like 80, somewhere around 80% of it comes from the Congo and around a hundred percent of that slave mind. And so of the pygmy people group, 400 to 600,000 of them in the Congo, most of them, almost all of them are enslaved unless they're deep enough in the rainforest to be avoiding that. But the rainforest is getting smaller over the size of Texas has been cut down in the last 20 years or 25 years. And uh, because of the rare minerals, it's also easier to put them in the mines because of their stature, because they're shorter. Um, and so- I was going to yeah. say that makes sense, but man, that doesn't even seem like the right thing to like- that doesn't even seem, that's not the right thing to say at all. It makes yeah. sense, but like, yeah, I could see that, our, but our core damn. humanity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, and I think the power imbalance started um, really, I mean, like centuries ago, but uh, they used to have a little bit of an upper hand because they uh, were getting the bushmeat. They were the hunters they would be able to go get rare and gatherers, which would get like rare things from the forest, um, different sure. fruits and herbs and, and roots and berries you know, and fruits yeah, and all berries, that kind yeah. of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Mushrooms, uh, all sorts of stuff. And they'd be able to bring back uh, antelope or sometimes elephants back in the day. And uh, like, like big uh, forest, um, like these wild hogs uh, that are, mm. that are that are great. They, they taste wonderful. Um, and, then whenever the chainsaws came around, first the ivory and rubber boom, uh, which came from Bel Belgium and King Leopold II, um, they enslaved 20 million people and 10 or 12 million of them they killed. What? And, so I, obviously I understand the ivory stuff to some degree, yeah. but the rubber, does that, that comes from a plant, doesn't it? Or it from trees. Yeah. Trees, so they'll, okay. make, they'll make slingshots just straight off the vines of these rubber trees. Um, oh, wow. and, uh, or maybe it's from the bark, but they, yeah, that, that was where Europe was getting all their rubber for their tires and, and things like mm. that. And then, um, yeah, with everything else that's come deforestation, the ebony, the mahogany, the other rare hardwoods that are there, um, that makes the animals scared and skittish. Right. And it makes, so and it makes the things that they're gathering scarce, um, not, not, not really there anymore. And so there became this power imbalance of, instead of living in a symbiotic relationship where they would come out and trade the meat and they would get corn and beans, um, they, weren't ever, they weren't able to adequately trade. Um, so there started a little bit of internal conflict. Then they had to just start providing for themselves. Then they were, it was hard for them to provide for themselves. And then their land was either bought or just made up and stolen from them. They, they make up fake documents saying, this is our land now. If you're going to live here, you're going to have to be our, you know, work for us. And then we get paid a money. And so even if it's not slavery on a scale of like in ropes or chains and being beaten, which I've seen, um, it can be more of indentured servitude, but modern day slavery where every single thing you eat uh, or have on your back you'll work for a week and you might get a shirt. You'll work every day and yeah. you might get two minnows or a banana or 10, 12 peanuts. 
Um, it sounds more like communism as opposed to, you know, what we would generally think of as, as traditional slavery, more the, the state, or in this case, a, a group of people control all the means of production and, and then divvy it out how they see fit. That's what it yeah, sounds like to me. Actually, it'd be, it'd be more like, I mean, like just to further explain it, it's either an entire tribe or other people group um, controls them, or it's even family controlling a family. And it's like oh. this one family owns this set of, of people and they give them scraps of their dinner. Like they eat the big plates and then just whatever was leftovers, they don't have fridges. So then, you know, they sit and wait for the scraps that would be given to them. And yeah. Like an animal, like my, like yeah. my dog would, I mean, that's yeah. like, that's horrible. Well, that I've seen them not eat from plates that if, if, if I was eating in a community and I had it and I just wanted to share half my food with some of the pygmy people, I'd give it to them. And then whenever they're turning in plates, any of the ones that the pygmy people touched, they would, they wouldn't even want them back. And it's like, wait a second, now you're gonna have to go buy more plates. Um, what are you talking about? So to see that kind of discrimination is like, it's, it's mind blowing or them, them being taught. And I think this goes back to the Belgians, but, um, and not to, to, to point them out, but at the same time, they were taught, you can't look a white person in the eyes. And the, so the pygmy that, people were, you're saying, and, and they're now who's their slave master. So it depends on where you go. But whenever I've gone there before, there's, there's been a thing where they feel like they can't look you in the eyes. They look down. And so I've like lowered my level so that I can make eye contact with them. And I've told them I'm not that guy. And this is a, this is a myth. Like, this is, this is not right. Like you're every bit as equal yeah. as I am. So the, the whole thing though about our nonprofit is how do we fight for people in the way that's the most sustainable possible and create opportunities for them? We say charity, quote unquote, can be great, but opportunity is always better. So how do we create opportunities for people to rise? And um, because there's been some really toxic charity out there where there's over 230,000 broken water wells in Africa right now, that's billions of wasted charitable dollars. And that's because a lot of organizations go in, they drill a well, and then they bail. Um, what's wrong with them? They, well, you say they're broken. What, what's wrong with the wells? It might need a $2 fix. It might need a, need a $150 fix. But or nobody was ever- or something like, or a pulley or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, like a little coupling inside pump. of the, the, the pump. Yeah, sure. the pipes or a little maintenance on the pump. Might just need to be cleaned out. Maybe some sediment from uh, the slits on the side of the the pipes you know some some clay got in there and, and it just needs to be washed um, right. but nobody was they don't even have the tools to unscrew the the nuts or bolts at the top and um they, they don't have the education for it no one ever equipped them educated mm. them empowered them to say hey this is your well it's been the white guy's well or it's been the ngos well or it's been the people that were given it that way and so what we do is we create they, they have a community contribution and participation where they're feeding our well drillers who are all locals. Um, those are the local heroes, um, either feeding them, giving them lodging, uh, helping with the tools, like getting stuff into the village. If it's off the nearest like roadside and into the village, sometimes in the forest might take an hour hike. Our longest was like a three hour hike off the road. Um, can't drive there. And so you're taking one ton of well drilling equipment some of the most backbreaking work uh, I could imagine. Oh, sure. But yeah. it's, it's 20 foot long pipe, six meters, um, uh, galvanized steel pipes or big PVC pipes that are six inches, in, six inch, seven inch casing, augers, chisels, rock breakers, tripods, um, chains, and uh, carrying in bags of cement that are 100 pounds or literally bags of bricks, bags of stone or gravel, and bags of sand. So we always get them to have participation because if you just give something away, one, it can cripple a community. There's a really good book out called When Helping Hurts. And okay. uh, it talks about toxic charity and charity done with good intent, well-meaning, good-hearted, but not truly thinking of the repercussions. And because of that, there's been a lot of things of like called people quote, calling it voluntourism you know, buying thousand dollar tickets or $2,000 tickets, going and painting a building whenever you just took a job of a local painter or going and, and re reconstructing something or, or going there. And even, even we do it on the governmental level in, in mass quantities from China, India, even the U S where we subsidize 
rice and corn and we take it into Africa and we undercut the local farmer right. who is farming corn. He needs to sell that right. and needs to pr- put food yep. on his family's table. And whenever, whenever a major organization or major nation comes in and says, here, this is free, or they come in and say, hey, this is half price or one-tenth of the price of what you could buy it from your neighbor, like it literally makes it impossible for them to grow and to flourish That's interesting. and build a business. So we've, we've always been trying to think that way through. Of, um, not always. It was a learning process in my first two trips. And I drilled a well before I went and lived there for a year and, uh, and it got broken two weeks, three weeks later. And then they thought I was just going to come back and fix it. And, uh, with my team of guys who were community development specialists had degrees in this, but when I met them, they were selling meat at the market. They were selling SIM cards. They were doing, these are locals. Whatever they could. Yeah. Local people that were okay. born and raised there. And, uh, but had a degree wanting to, to help their nation, but there weren't any job opportunities for it. Um, I was like, what do we do here? And they go, Hey, we just kind of gave that well away. We make them pay. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, that makes sense. And I go, but, it, but in my heart and being from the West and seeing how little they had, um, I was like, well, I don't know if this feels right. You know, I started a charity, a nonprofit and, uh, and they're like, listen, if they don't pay for the repair, they're just going to think you're going to come back and fix it every time or that we're going to come back and fix it every time. And it's, they don't, they don't have ownership of it. They don't yes. have buy-in. They don't, it wasn't an opportunity to instill or create or for them to grab hold of dignity. This was actually like an internal belief system that they can't do it for themselves. So we need someone else to do it. And if it breaks, they'll fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and me finding out it was broken on purpose I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. How'd this happen? Right. Because, so somebody, that's the way you worded that. I was like, wait a second. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're saying so, somebody broke it, not that yeah, it just it, broke. Right. Yeah. We don't have wells that really just break. No, they might need some maintenance and stuff like that. But uh, anyways, it was a learning lesson on my first well. And I was so grateful for it and our team because we went in, we were excited. We drilled a well for a university and for the teachers and their children. But this high school that was nearby their well needed some maintenance and they never let the kids uh, of the professors and stuff drink uh, from the high schooler as well or the uh, secondary school. So when the secondary schools came, students came over when their well that we were going to help fix also, um, they came over to drink. Anyways, make the long story short, the kids just popped off jokingly, maybe seriously too, but they go, hey, you don't want to let us drink from your well. This is our well, don't drink from it. So the kids decided just right then, uh, like break it out of meanness. So, so that nobody had clean water. And I was like, Whoa, this, this problem could just crazy. be perpetuated if, if there's not some sort of thing. So we had a community meeting and the great thing that happened was uh, the people that I knew that had a heart for this, a degree for this. And also like the forethought of that I didn't have listening to them, learning from them. They said, uh, you're going to pay for it. It was $150 fix. So they were like, wait, really? And it was like a learning moment for everyone in the community. Oh, we need to protect this thing. So they had to pull together, get the $150. They bought a new pump. We came in and we installed it. Right after that, they had another meeting, invited us back. And they started a little committee within the community with a secretary and a treasurer. And they started like, a, they put a fence around it. They, they started a sign-up sheet of who's going to monitor when the well was open, which they opened it six times a day for six hours. So people knew a schedule of when to come mm-hmm. to it because they, since it was broken out of malice, they wanted to have eyes on it. And they had uh, brooms and things to keep it clean. And they had a cleaning schedule for it. And all of a sudden it wasn't our well, it was their well. It was well. theirs, and right. Yeah. So that, that's what we've always tried to do is like, have, how do we invite them in to be part of the solution? How did you, how did you even get introduced to this? Cause I, I imagine one of the things that you probably get some pushback on is, you know, we as Americans don't really know that cultures and societies exist outside of America. You know, I'm guilty of that too. And, and I imagine maybe I'm wrong that people are like, well, you know, we have our own problems. Like, why are you worrying about that? When we have our own problems here, we can deal with. So I'm really curious about that. And then even how you got introduced to, uh, the, the pygmy people and really felt like that was where you wanted to pour your time and energy and resources. 
yeah, this might take up most of our time, but I'm going to, it's I'll all good, man. It. That's, I love it. Like I'm okay. super interested in this stuff. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, you're right, man. I, I had blinders on to just, um, this American bubble and I've had people at some like country Western concerts, which I love the musicians and they had me speak there. And afterwards, some people were like, why are you helping them? Because right, they're like drunk right. and spitting on me saying, yeah, I got to help my own kind and my own countrymen and all this stuff. And yeah. I was like, for sure. Guess what? I, I one, I try to do something locally every week, like some sort of volunteer work in Austin or in Oklahoma City every week. I try to do something nationally if I can every month or and I try to do something inter internationally every year. That's why I go back at least once a year. Um, and for me, that's just what's worked for me, what I like. And if I could spend all my time over there, I would. But we have to fundraise. We have to. Uh, I have thought about living there full time. I've, I've built up two years there. But here's how I got there. I was 23 years old and I'd gotten off the Ultimate Fighter and I was fighting drug addiction. And that was a real struggle for me. Um, I've, I've gone in waves. Are you, of are you sober now? Yeah, I am. And, uh, and I'm actually in recovery, working a program uh, and have a spawn. I mean, it's been incredible awesome. for me. Yeah, it's, it's been awesome. incredible for me. Uh, I've gone to treatment twice uh, for 90 days, one and another 90 day program, but only 30 of it was in treatment the other was called iop intensive outpatient and uh and it was it was awesome um but it i purpose got me sober for four or five years before i even knew about the recovery scene or community or tools or programs and um it was purpose that saved my life and it, at first it was in denver it was at the children's hospital and i started uh working on the oncology unit or volunteering there um multiple times a week and I'd take the kids out into the outside just so they get some fresh air or do do room visits and play games with them. And 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 sometimes I got to be there for their surgeries when they're getting put asleep. Their mom's bringing me back with them and holding their hands. And it was awesome. I loved it. Uh, but I'd stopped fighting because win or lose, I had an excuse to use. So I stopped fighting for a year. I said I was going to sacrifice it. What was your about, what was your excuse? You say win or lose, I had an excuse to use. Like what yeah, does that mean? Well, when when you want to celebrate because you've spent six months or three months or whatever it is, like uh, working hard. Clean and dialed um, in. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Clean dialed in. So in wrestling culture, you'd call it a reset. You call it a reset weekend. I just need a reset. But Sounds my reset nice. could never when I like I once I start, I couldn't stop. And uh like one's too much and a thousand's not enough. And mm. I was like, I was that guy, like balls of the wall, like give, yeah, it, give it all to me. And sure. um, there, they which is also that. probably part of the reason you're so good at what you do now, because of the same characteristics that, that were you, you were utilizing while you were using. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like there's a drive of like, I don't want to call it an extra gear, but it, it, well, I mean, some people have that. And for me, it's like, well, don't tell me it can't can't happen i mean just like don't tell me you can't have my drugs i'll get them it'd be like don't yeah. tell me this won't work like let's find the way to make it work and um and so uh but i think i was too scattered not just at the children's hospital but at the denver rescue mission with the homeless and then um and 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 just loving on them in an inner city youth group and man i said a prayer um god what do you want to do with my life and because i was 10 months without a paycheck and I was like uh, volunteering a lot, but that wasn't paying the bills. And, and uh, I was just like, what do I do? Like, what do I do? And um, I didn't even really know much about the God thing or higher power thing or source of love or whatever. I was just like, I need some direction. I don't know if this is going to work, but I said a prayer. God, what are you going to do with my life? Did that. And then I've, I've experimented with a lot of psychedelics. I've had doctor guided, psychiatrist guided, uh, shaman guided, like ayahuasca and DMT and bufo and mushrooms and mm -hmm. uh, ketamine and all this stuff, man, the most epic, most incredible, most profound, but also the most confusing, uh, vision of my life happened 10 months sober without trying to prompt it, without hunting for it, without hoping for it. It was just like, God, what do I do with my life? And it was a movie in my mind and I was walking down a footpath in the forest and I was moving thickets and vines out of the way. And then I heard drumming and then I came into a clearing 
And uh, well, after the drumming, I heard this distinct singing. And when I came into a clearing there, I, it, I'll, I'll never forget it. There was these twig and leaf huts. And I met these people. I didn't talk with them, but I saw them and kind of acknowledged them. They acknowledged me, but first guy was coughing and you could almost see his ribs. You could see his ribs. He almost looked like he was starving and looked very sick. And I, I was flooded with this, I don't know, just knowledge that they're hungry, thirsty, poor, sick, oppressed, and enslaved. And I wrote down on a piece of paper, forgotten, that they felt forgotten. Like they were the forgotten wow. people. So you didn't even know who this was at the, at the time. Oh, dude, I had no, no clue at all. Okay, and uh, three days later, I, I cried a puddle of tears like this big. I, I don't know. It's like a silver dollar size or grandma's cookie size uh, puddle of tears. And I've never cried like that for anyone in my life. Still to this day, I've cried several times, especially with seeing some of the stuff I've seen. But this right. just wrecked me in a way that I've, I've, I never had hit me so hard, so real. But then I also felt a little crazy. I was confused by it. I was like, what's going on? Who are these people? Where are these people? I, I didn't know geography. I was ignorant to it. And I was like thinking of jungle. I was like, it wasn't Brazil. It wasn't India. It wasn't China. It wasn't uh, Thailand. And I thought of Africa as barren. I thought of it as right. desert, Egypt, desert dirt, or right. Sahara and, and lions and giraffes. I didn't know that they had the second largest rainforest in the world. So three days later, I told uh, who had become a friend, but I just met him. His name was Caleb, and he had been friends with Bear Grylls, and he wrote a forward of his book. And so, anyways, I, I met this guy. He had lived with the Vanuatu tribe. So there's some of these crazy stories or people were asking him about it. And the Vanuatu tribe invented bungee jumping. Uh, they would tie vines around their their feet and they would jump off these huge platforms. And then he had lived with the Maasai tribe, the guys that hunt lions with spears and um, I was just like, whoa. And, and I was never going to see him again. I thought I would never tell anyone this because I sounded kind of crazy. I have some sort of psychotic episode. Right. So I, I, it was I, that visceral for you. Is that real? That visceral that I was like, did I have a psychedelic reactivation? Did, wow. am I going, am I going crazy? Uh, were you dreaming so or were you awake? No, I was awake. I was awake. Dang. I was awake. I was on, dude, I would, it'll sound maybe too religious or something, but it wasn't, it was a, it was a spiritual experience, but like, I don't think I'm a religious dude, but I, I was on my knees and on my forearms and on my face, basically. And I just was like, I just was desperate to hear something, but I still wasn't trying to conjure anything up. I didn't know that was going to happen. And it was like the most vivid, real movie in my mind. I lived at the Olympic training center. I have had sports psychologists a hundred times walk me through seeing the perfect match, feel the thrill of victory. Also, the difference between the sports psychologist and the Olympic gold medalist, they would always take you through almost worst case scenario and how you battle back. And you'd have mm. to see it a hundred times in your mind before you ever go do it. And I've seen the power of visualization, but this came to me in a way that I've never experienced. And so I tell Caleb and Caleb says, at the end of the vision, I think literally he's going to one state. I'm going to another state. I'm not going to see this dude. Maybe it's safe for him to think I'm crazy. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I tell him and he goes, he goes, I know who they are. I said, what? He goes, those are the, those are the Mabuti Pygmy people. And I go, really? Ooh. He goes, they're in the Congo. And I'm like, where? And he goes, wait, I'm why did he think that? Uh, he, was think, like... he was going there in three and a half weeks to do a scouting trip to see if Got there was any, to assess their needs, see if there was anything we could help with, meet them, love on them, <clears throat> and just and just see if that was the next group. And Caleb hasn't been back since, but he tells me the story. He tells me how three days three days ago, whenever I had the vision, he found out his team was all canceling. The rebels had taken over the airport. The U.S. State Department said no American for any reason go there. Uh, his wife was pregnant. They had like a two-year-old. Um, and he said the day we met or the day before, it, uh, Jess said, um, you know, you need to sign if you're going to go here or not. Like, uh, and he goes, okay. Cause she wanted him to cancel it. And so when he met me and I told him that he's like, he's like, come tell Jess. So I go tell Jess and she just looks at, looks at him and says, you got to take him. And she's pregnant. She's like six months pregnant or so. And, and, like, and another one at home, it sounds like. Yes, and another one at home. I thought it was crazy. And they're saying that military were being decapitated in the streets and that people were being hunted and killed and all this stuff. I'm like, whoa, what are, like, this isn't a, 
if I ever thought I was going to go to Africa, maybe for a safari, but I'm like, right. this, is, this is something I've never signed up for. And right. so Caleb asked me a pointed question where it was, if you don't go, you'll never know. He goes, you'll always ask why, or, or what if, what if, what would have happened? Um, and you always question yourself. He goes, I'm, he said something to the fact of I'm the type of guy that on my deathbed, like, I don't want to have those questions. He goes, so are you going to be able to handle that? And I'm just like, whoa. So we went, took like four or five airplanes, got out on a truck and we uh, drove six hours or so and then got on motorcycles for an hour or two and then got on a dugout canoe with crocodiles and hippos in this powerful river and went across. We hiked for about 30 minutes. It was Caleb, Colin and I. And all of a sudden I hear drumming, hear singing, come into a clearing. First guy we met had tuberculosis, was the exact guy from the vision. I dropped. Well, my, and the drumming my, was from the vision too? Yeah. My, knee, I, my knees were weak to where I sat down into a squat with my elbows on my, my knees. And then that was uncomfortable because Caleb and Colin were like, they were both grabbing my traps on each side of me saying, this is your vision. This is your vision. I had oh. the piece of paper with me that said forgotten at the top, hungry, thirsty, poor, sick, oppressed. I take a full knee. I'm just watching it. I'm like, holy smokes, this is, this shit can really happen. And, and why? And can it? Like also questioning it. And yeah, then they came man. up to us and told us how they're hungry, thirsty, poor, sick, oppressed. The last day I was there, I asked Caleb, I go, what am I doing here? Like they're asking for water. They're asking for land. They're asking for food where they're saying that's their needs. I don't know how to do that. I'm just some fighter. Like, what am I supposed to do about this? And I think I got the confirmation when the chief came up to me and said, hey, everyone else calls us the forest people. But we call ourselves the forgotten the exact thing I wrote down. Same that's they, word. That's the name fight for the forgotten. They gave that to me, the vision and them. Like it didn't come from me. I know that. And so I, I was blown away. I started crying right there. And the chief goes, we don't have a voice. Can you help us have one? I'm not the hero of the story, but like, I was like, whoa, I can, that's one thing I can do. Like, I, I don't know how to buy land in another nation. I've never bought it in my own country. Like I, 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 I don't know how to drill for water. Um, I just turn a spout. Like, I, I don't know how to do that. And when he said, have a voice, I'm like, man, you know, being an American, I've got free speech, uh, you know, being, having a platform from fighting and, and other things and having friends, a podcast and stuff, I could share their story. So I said, yes, but like, I think my soul screamed yes. And then it was like, okay, they just gave me something I can do. How do we do the rest of it? And so started finding boots on the ground, people with the passion, the purpose, and they just needed the resources. They just needed the education or they had the education. They just needed the equipment, a lot of them. And so, and then when it came specifically to well drilling, I came back, got trained on how to drill wells, took $15,000 of well drilling equipment over with me, had 20, 25,000 brought over later, then got a truck we could drive around. Then now it's turned into 80 wells that they've drilled for themselves, providing water to well over 30,000 people. Uh, we've got back over 3000 acres of land. We've started four sustainable farms. They're able to feed themselves for the first time and then go to the markets and sell it from selling that they're able to pay school fees and buy school uniforms. Um, and now we're about to build a health center with a uh, maternity ward, um, uh, incubators. We got a $1.5 million donation in equipment. Uh, so they're, they're to outfit the hospital. All we have to do is build, build it. And so, and a school. It's amazing. And so like, yeah, for them to have, it's a two hour walk to the nearest health center for them. So to be able to put one right on their land, actually across the street from their land. So it's the community's health center. We don't want it to look like it's just for the pygmy people. It's going to serve them, but it's going to serve the greater community. And one of the things that I've seen in reconciliation, well, one thing I've seen in my life was like, I was supposed to, I was fighting against people, but really I was supposed to be fighting for people. And now I get to do both fight against some guys in a sport so I can help raise awareness and funds to fight for people in her life. And then it's been incredible. Is that what you, well, I was just going to ask, is that what you, so with, with your, your combat sports, martial arts, is, is that, is that means to an end? Is that, cause that's what I'm hearing you say is like, I do that yeah. so I can fund what I'm doing over here. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. That's the reason. I mean, I, I, 
second area is I'm a competitor and I love sure, it. Sure, of I course. Think, I don't think I've, I, I think I have unfinished business and that I want to compete at a very high level. And so I'm getting there and uh, I want to challenge that to be my challenge, but I would never trade that. I would never trade fighting against a person in a cage to, to not fight for people with purpose and passion. But since I can match them and pair them together, I think it's the person with the most reasons that usually wins. And so stack reasons, wherever you are in your life, if it's your family, the Olympics are happening now, you're going to see some people that were dark horses that break world records, get the Olympic gold, and they did it for their mom with cancer that's in the stands or that's from a hospital bed or that passed and was never able to see it. Um, and uh, or whatever it is that's driving them for their country, for their community to show kids that there's a way out. And it's the person that stacks the most reason. So whenever I look across the cage from a guy, uh, before I had this purpose, I always had the thought like, I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. No. But now when I'm looking him in the eyes, I'm like, you don't have as many reasons as me. You just don't. And like, I have to remember who I'm fighting for, like why and who I'm fighting for. Remember why, remember who. Um, I think, I don't know if it's my friend Tim Kennedy or if it's in the military world, but it's like, man, the, the most dangerous soldiers aren't the ones that are fueled out of hate at their enemy in front of them. They're fueled by love for the people behind them, the people they're trying right. to protect and the people they're trying to help. How do you, how do you handle loss in those situations when you place such a high stake yeah. on, like, you're not even doing it for you anymore. You're doing it for other people. And then do you feel like, okay, well, I failed or I've let people down. And how does that change the way that you handle loss? Yeah. So that's an interesting question that I will take with me um, for if and when, or, you know, if I, if I cross that road, uh, since coming back, I'm on a six fight win streak. There's been some significant breaks in between there from injury, malaria, uh, purpose, but the last three fights were really about purpose and we really featured the nonprofit and we're really able to elevate their voice. And I'm, I've, I've won those. And those were the only ones I've ever been able to smile afterwards. Hmm. I, I don't think I was ever externally a sore loser, but internally I was. And I think I you would, gotta have to be like, yeah. I, I'm always, I'm always a little bit taken back by this, like, Oh, you know, failure is okay. And it's okay to lose. I'm like, no, it's, like my perception is no, it's not okay to lose. Like I know I'm going to, but I'm not going to accept it. I'm certainly not going yeah. to embrace it. Yeah. Well, I would get my hand raised. And I think, I think there's a fine line because I would get my hand raised and wouldn't allow myself to smile because I was already thinking about all the things I did wrong whenever nobody else noticed anything. Coach is saying great sure. fight fans cheering. I'm already mad at myself. So I think there's a balance <laughs> because I mean, I think I would take it probably harder because now there's so much purpose. Uh, but hopefully I can have my head held high in a way that like, not, a, not a totally accepting it, but I think I can accept it. Raphael had this thing where he's like, dude, I'm never, I'm never disappointed in my fighters, my, my competitors that go in there and leave it all on the line because they can come out with their head held high. I'll hold my head high. We'll go to the back and we'll talk what happened and and think about it while it's fresh and say you could have done this or could have done that but he goes i'm not going to beat them down he goes the guys that i'm disappointed in are the ones that are already going to be disappointed in themselves because they didn't leave it all out there mm. and that resonates with me like if you've left no stone unturned and you go out there and you really lay it on the line then and you're doing it for the right reasons from the right heart and mental toughness and the guy was just a little better than you that day then he got you and you can, right. you can rest assured that I'll get better from this. And uh, that wasn't my night. But yeah, man, I think, I think for, for me, it's going to be interesting to, to cross that bridge when we get there. Because I think now what's really important is I have a great, for me personally, I got a great board. I have a great sober support network. I have a great partner who is all about not just affirmations, but like daily practices and putting action behind the affirmations. Mm -hmm. And so like speaks life into me and that I, I'm motivated by the way she lives her life. 
and I can be like, wow, I'm around such good people that I know I can, I can be open. And I think, I think here's the thing, whenever I go into a fight, I've got to be able to say, I got this, this is my time. This is why I work so hard. But I think in the times of loss, whenever those emotions come up, I think it's a, for at least an addict, an alcoholic who there's more stake at stake. There's, there's bigger consequences, almost like going into a fight. There's consequences in that. Um, for me, it's like the three most dangerous words when it comes to my sobriety is I got this. Mm. And maybe the three most helpful words are I need help. You know, I need help. I need to learn. What do you think? How would you handle this? Yeah. And, and, and then being able to make my own decisions saying not everything people going back to fighting, not every suggestion people give is going to work for you and your style. Like, uh, if someone tries to make me a, uh, fight like Israel Adesanya and become the next best kickboxer, like that's well, not you're not style bender or what? Come on. I'm not now. style bender. That's not my style. I love the guy. I'm going to see <laughs> him sure. this weekend, uh, fight in Houston. So, awesome. uh, but that's not my style. It works for him. It doesn't work for me. Uh, I'm a guy that takes people down and pounds on them and, and, and chokes them out. Like I've got a, if you got tools there, let me know. You got some defensive stuff on your feet. Let me know. I, I might be able to take one or two of mm -hmm. these things on the feet and implement them in a way that, that I got to be open-minded to it all, hear it all, field all the, the uh, advice and instruction, but then I've got to make it mine and be like, right. oh, well, that works for them. And in theory, it's good, but my arm's not as long as his, uh, my feet, my legs don't go as high. Uh, and I'm a, <laughs> I'm a heavyweight. That's not going to throw a lot of people in like a triangle off my back. Cause I've never been on my back in a fight. So <laughs> I need to know how to get up. I need to know how to reverse it. So same thing, whenever hard things happen, like I need to have some good people that have handled some, some heartbreaking loss, which I have some great coaches that have that experience that whenever if I'm there, that they'll, they'll be there around me and give me some advice. And I'll just have to remind myself, you know, like, Hey, at the end of the day, this was a cage fight, but, yeah. but at the end of the day with fight for the forgotten, like it's literally defeating waterborne disease, which is going to save lives. So that's, yeah, it's, it's literally life and death scenarios you're talking about. Yeah. You mentioned something and I, and I don't mean to pry, but I do, I do want to address this because I'm always trying to think about like, okay, well, what am like, what are the people who are listening thinking right now? And you said sure. something about a, a woman in your life as a support. I can't remember the exact term you used. Is that somebody who is just in your corner or is that like a romantic interest? Romantic, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. She's, okay. she's my girlfriend. I, I, we're making a Got ring. It. I'm getting a ring made. Can't wait for Valentine's Day. And uh, awesome. well, anyway, it's just uh, that I'm wanting to propose sometime soon. And okay, well, she's not going to listen to this before you do that, though, right? No, I'll make sure. Okay. Uh, no, right. actually, I, it's not Valentine's Day. We just have some some awesome plans. I'm surprising her with. But okay, good. I'm just for, making for me, sure. I don't want to ruin anything. Yeah, yeah. There. No, you're good. The so I I was married and 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 went through a divorce, and she had two, and then we had she had maybe three years. I had a year single. And then, then we got together and dude, she just lives and breathes this stuff. She's got her own podcast. It's called the Amy Edwards show. She's, um, has wrote five rock albums. I think she's headlined or played really? at Playboy mansion and she's played with Motley Crue and she's played Maroon five and she's played with like wow. all sorts of people and she's wrote two books. And, and to me, she's the most badass mom I've ever seen. And so I'm like, how do you do all this? And do you do have kids so of your own? I don't have kids of my own. Okay. So that's going to change some things. Yeah. It's going to change some things. And I, I get to, uh, to hopefully be a good man in their lives, you know, hopefully play a role of a father figure type, but I know I'll never be dad. Uh, so, yeah, but I mean, there's, there's, you know, biological father and then there's dad, you know, and those, yeah. Sometimes they correlate and sometimes they don't. And you can always be a father figure in somebody's life for sure. Right. Exactly. And for me, it's like, I have an opportunity to step into a family of three girls, um, two, two young women and, and, and my like rock star. Bro, they're going to work you over. They are going to oh, yeah. work. You, you know, oh, you, yeah. you, you think you're, you're, you know, you're a, you're a badass now. Like just, just wait, they're going to work you over. My daughter's got me wrapped around her finger. Oh man. Yeah. For sure. I, I know it's, I know it's coming. It's already, it already has started. And so I'll, uh, I'm excited for that journey just to be able to, 
yeah, try to love them well. But the thing that she has helped me with the most is I think, I think all of us have different external circumstances, right? But a lot of times we can all resonate with, with having similar internal conditions, like outside circumstances may look completely different, but internally our circumstances or condition kind of come down to a lot of the same things. And for me, I had a feeling of, um, you know, especially going back to my addiction, I'm not enough or I'm inadequate or feeling shame and guilt and uh, worthlessness. Uh, I was bullied a lot growing up. So I'd hear the things they said about me, like you're worthless or you should just kill yourself or you're not good enough. So those things could be on tape recording whenever things don't go right in my life. And when I went to treatment and then Amy also reminded me of a book, it's called Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. And uh, just, I mean, the book is good, but just the title was like, she'll remind me, she goes, hey, like, don't be seeking this external validation. Don't be, don't be uh, looking to me to, to fill everything. You know, that's codependency. She's like, uh, and, and, and we get to help each other in accountability there where it's like, hey, we got to love ourselves like our life depends on it. Why? Because mm. it fucking does. And, and if we can do that well, then all the rest, like we're, I don't know, it's kind of, I already feel like my life is, I'm in the bonus rounds, but it's, it's like everyone else's love. If I can love myself, well, if I, if everyone else loves me and I can't love myself, it's pretty meaningless. But if right. I can love myself, then I just need a couple of people, a few people to love me and I'll have a happy life. She sounds great, man. I'm, yeah. I'm excited for you. Does she go to uh, Uganda for, is that mostly where you go? You go to Uganda or other places? Yeah. So or? Congo and Uganda and, and we've drilled a well in Tanzania and Kenya and Rwanda. I think I said Rwanda twice, but the, the main footprint we have right now is in Uganda. And that's because we just have everything's lined up so well for us and not us, but for them. <laughs> and so we might have the president. Us, you're part of that. The land and yeah, us. That's, that's what I mean when I say it. A lot of times over here, people are like, I think I'm talking about just me. And I'm like, no, that's my family. And yeah, everything's lining up. We're two or three miles off the Congo border. We've had people coming over that we've been helping that are Congolese refugees that are from the Pygmy tribe. And uh, it's just safer. It's a lot safer. And so we can get more done. And so we want to, we want to do what we do now and the, prove the concept of the health center, the school and the marketplace. We've already built 32 homes uh, and uh, moving them from being evicted from the rainforest and living in these little shacks to now two bedroom homes with like a, a, a patio on the outside and outdoor kitchen. So no smoke gets in and, and running water and showers and, and toilets um, what is, uh, what is evicted from the rainforest mean? Is, is, is that because there's deforestation or, or somebody's trying to come, uh, claim that, that lumber, that wood or those resources? Like, what does that even mean? That that's, that's a foreign concept to me. Yeah. I would say that uh, to not name names, but there's some corruption that certain officials and organizations have said to protect wildlife or to protect the rainforest while at the same time, like banish the people, of the forest, the protectors of the forest, get them out of there. So they're, they're, at they're, the same time, they're deforesting it and poaching's happening. And these aren't the poachers and they're not the ones that are cutting down the trees. They can't live there, but these people from other nations can come there and cut down the trees and hunt the animals. And it's a money so, thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And so they were kicked out of the rainforest and they went from like in Uganda, the people group we're working with right now, smaller but they went from over 300 people down to 158 they were dying off because they were put behind a wow. slum put behind a slum and they were throwing out their sewage raw sewage and it was going over where the kids are playing in the dirt where their moms are cooking the meals where the dads are butchering the meat there's raw sewage all around and i was walking over like the mounds and i'm asking king zito he's actually the the chief and elder and, and king of the batwa pygmy people I go, what are, what are these mounds? It didn't make sense to me. He goes, they won't give us anywhere to bury our dead. They gave us one oh. acre to live on, and we live on top of our cemetery. Oh. Right. And the hospital's there, like, whenever they walk two miles, or sorry, two hours to the health center, and they don't treat them, but yet they die, then they take the bodies away, and then they won't release the body without a bribe. 
And so they, they've oh, been paid to get their loved ones the, back. Yeah. And there's been times that they can't do that. They're asking a hundred dollars and they don't get paid the money. And so it's an impossibility and they don't even get to have the body for a burial. And then we get to reclaim, recover the body. So it's it's been real jacked up. But uh, we're even we're we're building a cemetery, man, and and other things on the. We've got over fifty acres of land that's new, over three thousand acres. But but it's it's going to have a marketplace where they're going to have they're going to be raising goats, they're going to be selling produce, they're going to be beekeeping and and uh, having uh, bees, but honey and the production of honey. They're also going to raise queen bees and be able to sell that hopefully to other. Uh, bees are rad. I don't know if you know much about bees. My wife does some beekeeping. It's wow. insane. Like I don't, I know nothing and she knows little she's been through courses and things. She's been doing it for right. a couple of years. Bees are insane. They're incredible. They're absolutely incredible. Yeah. There's this hickory. I want to make sure I get it right, but, but it's hickory farms. Uh, and there's a guy that's a supporter of the fight for the forgotten and it's hickory tree farms, uh, hickory tree farm, apron apiaries however you say that but it's uh he's an incredible man that that has been supporting fight for the forgotten with 10 percent of his proceeds and when i started to overcome uh the podcast is called overcome with justin wren his, his beehives had been wrecked where he had like 40 oh. 44 beehives and he dropped down all the way to four four survived and i think it was pesticides that mm. took out his uh his bees and then he dug deep and he's back to like 110, 120 hives. So he's doing better than ever. And well, they're good, he's gonna be but they're also us. good for just the world. Like the world, we well, need bees. The world needs, yeah. bees. if you don't have bees, like we're all going to die. It's, it's that yeah. serious. Yeah. So it's going to be awesome having his help uh, to come in and really uh, teach it in a practical way. We're already like sourcing lumber and things like that to build the boxes and to have it in a simple way. Uh, and they, what's so cool is that the pygmy people, they risk their lives for honey. It's African bees, which are killer bees. And mm. they literally climb up trees, normally trying to smoke them out from the bottom. But oftentimes it's so high, the smoke doesn't get there. And they're literally fighting with uh, killer bees to get some honey. And they come back as heroes, you know, like for the kids yeah, and the wives. Sure. It's like a rite of passage really, for the boys, it, man. It Go really get some is. honey. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and so to, to be able to raise uh, bees in a sustainable way and to always have honey and to be able to sell it and to be able to even help other communities with bees, it's going to be it, finding my purpose and living that with passion, like living on purpose with a heart on fire. Like, dude, that thing has changed my life. I was just fighting for me and I realized I got to fight for others. I got to fight for me while I fight for others because I think I had an imbalance. I was first fighting against people. Then I was fighting for people and I forgot about myself and relapses had happened and things like that. Now it's like, you know what? Fight for myself and the life that I need to have, meaning I can only control my hula hoop, um, like the, the, the world around me just and like truly in control. And then as I keep going, like just try to expand that slowly, sustainably that can help others or just help them within their own community um their own hula hoop so i know that sounds like a weird analogy i just heard it the other day it doesn't it makes total sense man i think some sometimes not even sometimes quite often we look at all these external factors of you know what's going on in the world or what this person said on twitter or what the government's doing here and it's like okay <laughs> you know you could focus on all of those things and you can't do a dang thing about it or you can focus on like you're saying your your hula hoop you know your sphere of influence and you could really right. double down on those things and actually make a real difference, which is what you're doing. Oh, thank you, brother. It's been so cool. We, like from, I listed out some of those things, but one of the, the, one of the most powerful things I got to be part of is I learned real quick that if you just love one side, thinking, thinking in the way that they used to think, uh, I mean, even the spectators, the other people in the community, the community leaders, would say there's the pygmy people there there's there's their neighbors and they would i don't name those tribes normally because then it like villainizes them uh and normally any surrounding people group of the pygmy people will be oppressing them enslaving them all sorts of stuff but mm. like if i love that if i love them and hate the other side it's only going to come back and hurt the people i'm trying to love so right. what we found was like love both sides they're actually part of the same community 
They all need clean water. I've attended five funerals of the slave master kids because they died of dirty water or waterborne disease. And it's like, what if we could help a sustainable solution where, oh, your wife's not going to work. It's a single income family just because she has to collect water and cook all day. Um, uh, your kid can't go to school because your wife's trying to get a second job or get, get the second job in the household. And uh, you, now your kid ha can't go to school because they have to collect water all day. Well, let's, let's break this down even further. How much money are you spending on, on waterborne disease treatment? Uh, how many days are you staying home from, from work or school because you're sick? You know, right. and then seeing that, breaking that down per family, most of them are spending about half of their annual income, half of it, about $165, $185 a year. They're making a dollar, dollar 25 a year. And that's the slave master trap. They're not wealthy. It's like, you're spending so much money on waterborne illness. What if we bring in clean water for both sides? We'll drill a well mm -hmm. for you guys over here and a well for them over there. But, um, or if, if they live in close enough proximity, we'll just, this well here, we'll, we'll, we'll make it plenty to where everyone is served. And anyways, through that, we've seen 1,651 people transition out of slavery and into freedom. Like that's, that's been so cool. That's been- What, that's been uh, so cool. what languages do you speak? Well, I mean, I speak a little bit of a very broken dialect of Swahili. There's no Rosetta Stone for it. Swahili. It's like three or four, three or four languages in one. Okay. So, um, yeah, I would say. And you like can that. communicate fairly well at this point. Fair, I mean, decently. I've lost some of it because I haven't lived there in a while, and I haven't been back since COVID, which that's been hard for me. Um, I'm about to go back, hopefully, in, hopefully April first, and yeah. Um, then uh, yeah, but it's got Swahili, French um uh the local language and sometimes lingala in there there's over 200 spoken languages in congo there's a bunch i think there's 60 in uganda every tribe because every their, tribe their, basically had yeah right yeah 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 uh, but there's normally national languages and things like that but the the saying in swahili is in kenya or swahili was born in tanzania got sick in kenya died in uganda and they took it to congo to bury it so it's, it's a <laughs> it's just a saying of like they th those countries really can't communicate with each other in their dialect of swahili so yeah. um or it just sounds way different so they uh, yeah I've, I've i've got enough that i can get my point across and communicate I also have translators and and man sure. the language of love has been what's really been cool to see is like i've had I've had times where i was learning the language and didn't really know what everyone was saying but we were there sitting there belly laughing cheeks hurting around the fire because just doing life together like so right. much is, is spoken through body language and eye contact and laughter and love so that's that's what's been real fun that's awesome man well uh let us know where to connect with you if people want to learn more or get involved in some way like where, where should we send these guys to yeah so for fight for the forgotten if people want to support we're we're trying to build a little army or 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 a big one of of and we call it our fight club which is our monthly donor subscription or like donation group that you know for five dollars a month or more you're joining the club and if we could do that like a lot of nonprofits they they try to operate off one two three four big donors i know one nonprofit mm -hmm. that lost lost someone to COVID, and they're basically the organization yeah, changes everything up. Sure. Yeah, so building that base of people that will expand our mission, vision, we'll know our budgeting, we'll know how we'll grow and how we'll impact. So I'd love to invite people in on that. It's fightfortheforgotten.org. You can join the Fight Club there. You can find out stuff. You can share the website with people, invite them in, your friends, family, followers uh, to, to also donate. Uh, you can find me at, at the Big Pygmy on Instagram. And then my podcast is Overcome with Justin Wren. You can find that on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, anywhere you get podcasts. It's awesome. I'm just thinking about it and we'll, we'll sync all that up. I'm just thinking about it, you know, like five bucks a month. I mean, imagine 10,000 people doing that. Yes. Do they change everything? Or even There's just a thousand, everything. you know, like yeah. you're talking about 5,000 a month. Like, you know, when I hear that personally within my economic sphere, like that's not going to break me. That's not going to make me, but yeah. that's quite literally decades of income to these people you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, if you put it on scale, like that's five people's pay a day or $5,000, we can drill a well. Um, so we could drill another well per month if we just had a thousand people doing $5. Um, we also do stuff stateside with bullying and suicide prevention, but it's been really cool to see like that grow. I know one guy that has 75,000 
donors that are signed up for their monthly donation. And that changed everything for him. He was ahead of, of the game on that. And now they're able to do so much in the world. Whatever and that they for want, me, right? Yeah, that for me is like, you know, it's cool to have one or two big donors, but it's not as meaningful as having a whole whole army. You know, it's it, someone can stroke a check, which which I would appreciate that too, which would be incredible. Sure. But the uh, but in all honesty, like having having thousands of people believe in it, we've had ten, over ten thousand donors from all fifty states and sixty different nations, and that for me is that is is exemplifying the Swahili proverb they always taught me, which is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go f- far, go together. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we go far further together. And so uh, it, it, it's just fun to invite people in on being a blessing and an encouragement yeah. and empowering people. Right on brother. So well, I appreciate you. Yeah. Appreciate all your work. We'll sync it all up. We'll let the guys know where to go. And um, man, glad for our friendship. Glad we finally were able to make this happen. Yeah. Powerful, powerful conversation. Thanks for sharing your story. Yeah. I'm so grateful for you, man. Thank you. And if, uh, if and when you get down to Austin, let's do it on this side. And I'll be there. Uh, hang out. I'll be there. I'll let okay, you know. Bro. Thank you. Thank you.